I want to do a different kind of talk this morning for you. Um, because, you know, in listening to the conference introduction, and you listen to all the topics that we're going to be talking about in the next couple of days, microservices and the cloud and security, it, it always reminds me, when I hear these sort of conference introductions, it always reminds me of how we are right now people, right? We get paid to solve problems right now, and we are intensely interested in how to do things, right? Almost all of the talks you're going to hear uh, th at this conference, at most conferences, are all about a better way to do it or some experience I've had. It's all about right here, right now, let's get things done. But every now and then, you want to pause. Whatever you're doing, every now and then, you want to pause, take a breath, and think about why you're doing things. Wh why do you do this for a living, right? Clearly, it pays pretty well. But here's a room full of really smart people. You could go off and do a million different things, but you choose to do this. Why? All right? And that's kind of what I want to talk about. The why question is kind of a hard question to answer, and it's a hard question to talk about. So I'm going to talk about it in a weird kind of way. I am going to talk about the why question by telling you a story. It is a story that is really close to my heart, it's a, it's a fun story, so if nothing else, we'll all sort of get woken up this morning, kick off the conference. I think it's a fun story, but I also think it's a story that can speak to some of the issues around what we do, and it can teach us little things about what we've chosen to do for a living, and it can teach us great big things. And in particular, one of the great big things I think that this story can teach us is why we do this stuff. So, Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you the story, and then I'm going to circle back around at the end, and I'm going to try and make the case that this story has little things to teach us and great big things to teach us about how we spend our time. So here goes. Here's my story. It's the summer of 1969, and it's hot. I mean, it's really hot. And when it gets hot like this, people go a little crazy. Sometimes society goes a little crazy. And here in the summer of 1969, it seems like everything is going crazy. In the United States, there are huge and growing protests, sometimes violent protests against the Vietnam War. Here in Europe, at times, whole countries, France, for example, have been shut down in the last year as people take to the streets demonstrating for better education, a fairer society, a better government. And it's not just the you know, civil unrest that seems a little crazy here in the summer of 1969. There's also the pace of technological change. Because here in the summer of 1969, there are a few people, there's not very many of them, but there are a few people who work with computers. They're a little odd, but they're basically harmless. But here in the summer of 1969, the technology is changing so fast that these people who work with computers have had to learn a new word. That word is megabyte. Because here in the summer of 1969, it is now possible to buy a computer with not one, not two, but four megabytes of RAM. Can you believe that? Four megabytes of RAM. And that memory will only cost you 100,000 US dollars per megabyte. It's just insane. But if you want real crazy, look no further than the Cold War. Here in the summer of 1969, the Cold War has been going on for 25 years. This beautiful city here in the summer of 1969 is divided. Germany is divided. Europe is divided. The world is divided. On one side is the United States and what we call the West, and on the other side is the Soviet Union and, and basically Eastern Europe and a few other countries. And they have, these two sides have been locked in this not-quite-peace, not-quite-war thing for 25 years. For 25 years, they've been facing each other, armed to the teeth, each side waiting for the other side to make the first move, or make the first mistake, or to sneeze. And you better hope nobody sneezes, 
Because they, no matter who the they are from your point of view, they have thousands of nuclear weapons. We have thousands of nuclear weapons. Let me tell you, if those bombs start flying, if those bombs start flying, we all have about 15 minutes to live. So here in the summer of 1969, we are hanging on by our fingernails, living life 15 minutes at a time. But for once, for once, the newspapers here in the summer of 1969 are not filled with news of the Cold War or the heat or the technology or the civil unrest. For once, it's something else. It's Apollo. It's the project to land a person on the moon. But don't get me wrong, Apollo is all about the Cold War. See, in the late 1950s and the early 1960s, the Soviets were doing all these marvelous things in space. They launched the first Earth satellite. They put the first person in orbit. They got the first picture of the far side of the moon. Really, really crappy picture, but it was a marvelous achievement nevertheless. And the Cold War was like a chess game, right? They make a move, we make a move. And when you're going all around the world saying, hey, be on our side, we're the smart ones, we're going to win, you cannot afford to have the other side do all the spectacular, amazing stuff and not do something. So John Kennedy was president of the United States at the time, and it was the United States that felt like they had to do something about what the Soviets were doing in space. So Kennedy got his advisors together, and they came up with a strategy. And the strategy they came up with was based on the idea that if you're behind in a race, the way we, or the US, was behind in the space thing, it's better to be behind in a very long race, in a marathon, than it is in a very short race. Because in a long race, you have time to catch up. So Kennedy just decided to declare a marathon. Where can we go, he asked. Where can we go? in space that's far away, that'll turn this into a marathon. Kennedy's advisor said, well, the moon's pretty far away. Kennedy said, fine, we're going to the moon. Just a completely arbitrary goal. And we need a deadline. We need a stake in the calendar. 1970 is a nice round number. We are going to the moon by 1970. It's a completely arbitrary goal, completely arbitrary deadline. No one here has ever experienced that, have you? <laughs> so Kennedy got up in front of the US Congress, and he said, we are going to go to the moon by 1970. We're going to take a person, land them safely on the moon, return them to the Earth by 1970. And a funny thing happened after Kennedy gave that speech. You know, people, maybe you're walking down the street, and you see your friend, and you start talking, and you say, have you heard this Kennedy thing? The moon? We're going to the moon? I mean, Jules Verne and H.G. Wells, we are going to the moon. Who cares if it's about the Cold War? And it's funny, you could tell that Kennedy caught a little bit of that excitement, that fever, because a few months after he made the first speech, he made a second speech, and in that second speech, Kennedy said, words more or less, we choose to go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. So how hard is it to go to the moon? Well, it really all depends on how far the moon is away. And so I have a tennis ball here, right? Because whenever you talk about astronomical distances, right, you need an analog, right? So here's my tennis ball. This is the Earth, right? Then I have this little rubber ball. And if this is the moon, it's about the right size for the moon. Now, how far apart do you think the Earth and the moon are? Think about, you know, when you were in school, there was always that picture in your textbook, you know the picture I'm talking about? This is how tides work. You remember that picture? This is how a lunar eclipse happens with the shadows. There's always a picture and the Earth and the Moon are about this far apart. The Earth and the Moon, let me tell you, are not this far apart. That picture is about getting the Earth and the Moon on the same page. The Earth and the Moon are not this far apart. They're not this far apart. They're not this far apart. My arms aren't long enough to be about two meters at this scale. So when Kennedy said that we're going two meters by an arbitrary deadline, a few people had gone out into space. A handful of Russians, one American. Do you know how far they'd gotten into space? Not quite as high as the fuzz on this tennis ball. They hadn't made it out of the fuzz yet, and suddenly we're going two meters by an arbitrary deadline. 
It was just a completely insane project. So if you have this incredibly hard project and this impossible deadline, how do you even start? Like, what's the right thing to do to start? Well, I don't know what the right thing to do is, but I do know what they actually did, which is they did everything, everything all at the same time. They tried to think up everything that would have to be done to get people to the moon, right? The goal is to take a person, land them safely on the moon, return them to the Earth. Well, they tried to think up everything that would have to be done, and they started doing them all, all at the same time. And the prayer was that it would all come together at the last minute perfectly, because that's always a good plan. <laughs> so one of the things they did was they asked themselves, what's the simplest thing that could possibly work here? Right? Goal is person, land them on the moon, return them to the Earth. But we can't do that right at the beginning. So what's the simplest thing that we can do right now that will work? So how do we simplify it? Well, it's pretty obvious. You could leave the person out, right? If you just sent a machine to the moon and landed it on the moon and returned it to the Earth, that has got to be easier than people, because you know people like to breathe and eat, and they don't like radiation and all that stuff. So if you leave the person out, that would make it simpler. Maybe that's something we could do right up front. But could we make it simpler still, easier still? Sure. If you're just sending a machine and landing it on the moon, you don't have to bring it back. You can cut the trip in half. So that's got to be easier, right? But is that the easiest thing we could possibly do? Not quite. We need to talk about what this word land means, right? What if we redefine land as go screaming into the surface of the moon at, you know, 5,000 kilometers per hour, right? That would be landing of a sort. And we could take some pictures as the moon got closer and closer and closer. Thus was born Project Ranger, a project to hit the moon with a spaceship. Ranger 1 was launched in August of 1961. It's kind of a weird project, right? It's, the goal is to crash the spaceship. So Ranger 1 actually exceeded expectations. Certainly, it was ahead of schedule. Ranger 1 crashed into the Atlantic Ocean. Ranger 2 did better. It crashed into the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> Ranger 3, in all seriousness, did better. It made it all the way out to the orbit of the moon. Moon wasn't there at the time. And so Ranger 3 just went sailing on by out into the great beyond. Ranger 3 is still out there. Let's see, Ranger 4 actually hit the moon. Ranger 4 hit the moon, but it died on the way to the moon. It died electronically, and the stone-dead brick of a spaceship hit the moon. Is that success? No, not really. Let's see. Five. Ranger 5 was apparently worried about Ranger 3 and joined it in the great beyond. <laughs> Ranger 6 had a textbook three-day trip to the moon. It takes about three days to get to the moon. And on the morning of that third day, the people behind Ranger 6 realized, hey, the spaceship's working, and now it's falling towards the moon. Neither God nor Isaac Newton is going to keep this thing from hitting the moon. And the only thing left to do was turn on the TV cameras and get these cool pictures of the moon getting bigger and bigger. And they commanded the cameras to go on, and nothing happened. And Ranger 6 went screaming into the moon, blind as a bat. Ranger 7 actually worked. Ranger 7 actually worked, and it took these pictures as it got closer and closer and closer to the moon. And this last picture is kind of a symbol of Ranger 7 working, because it took the whole picture, and it was radioing it back, and it got about halfway through radioing the picture back when the lights went out. And so you can bet that when this picture showed up, the people behind Ranger 7 were slapping each other on the back and drinking champagne. But you can also bet that they were thinking, my god, it took us seven tries and two years to do the simplest thing that could possibly work. How are we ever going to do the whole thing? And the answer is they were doing everything all at the same time. So while they were trying to hit the, hit the moon with Rangers, they realized that, well, they were also building these giant going-to-the-moon rockets. 
but those rockets were not going to be ready in time to train people, train the astronauts, train the people at Mission Control on the things they needed to know to, to actually make it to the moon. So they built this whole separate thing called Gemini, which is a two-person spaceship that would go up into orbit just so that the astronauts could practice those going to the moon skills. And they learned a lot in Gemini. One of the things they learned is about steering rockets. Um, every spaceship has these rockets all over it, little tiny rockets, steering rockets, and they make it turn left, turn right, nose up, nose down, spin. It's the kind of thing an airplane does with flaps and a rudder, but there's no air in space, so you have these little rockets. What they discovered in Gemini is what happens if one of those rockets goes on and stays on and will not shut off. And the answer is that your spaceship starts to spin slowly at first, but then faster and faster and faster. And the other thing they learned was that when that happens, the people inside the spaceship, after a while, they can't see anymore as the world literally goes spinning around. But the other thing they learned was that if you have an astronaut in that spinning spaceship, who is calm enough to work the problem while he's literally spinning out of control and can find the controls, the switches to throw without being able to see what he's doing, this is a survivable accident, and survive they did. That is something to know. While they're trying to hit the moon with rangers, while they're sending people up in Gemini, they're building these enormous workshops. And they're building these workshops so that they have a place to build these gigantic going-to-the-moon rockets. And the end result of that is this. This is the largest rocket ever built. It stands about 27 stories tall, it weighs about 3 million kilograms, and it only has one purpose. One purpose. To throw the very pointy bit at the top, the very, you can barely see it up there, at the moon. Because the very pointy bit, you can see it better here, at the top is the result of yet another project. This is the Apollo mothership, and this is a spaceship designed to keep three people alive, for two weeks, take them to the moon, bring them back. It's got, it's a marvel of 1960s technology. It's got shielding to keep the radiation out. It can carry food and water and air for three people for two weeks. It's got this big rocket engine on the bottom to blast them back to the Earth. It's got a heat shield and parachutes, and it floats because it lands in the ocean. It is a brilliant piece of technology, and there's only one thing wrong with it with all the heat shields and the parachutes and the big rocket engine and all the rest of it, it's actually too heavy to land on the moon. It can go from the Earth to the moon, can orbit around the moon, and it can come back, but it can't make the last 50, 60 kilometer trip down to the moon. So for that, we have this. This bizarre looking contraption is a specialized little spaceship and it's designed to take two of the three people from orbit around the moon down to the surface of the moon. So two people get in this thing and go down to the moon. One guy stays in orbit to watch the mothership. So the plan is to send these two spaceships out carrying these guys. This is a, the crew of Apollo 11. They are the peop first people to try to land on the surface of the moon. And this guy here is Buzz Aldrin. And he is an expert in space navigation, or to put it another way, in not flying off into the great beyond. Right? Can you imagine why they have him on the trip? He is one of the, Buzz Aldrin is one of the two people who are actually going to try and land on the moon. The guy on the other side is Neil Armstrong, and we've already met Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong was the guy in the spinning out of, out of control spaceship who could work the problem without being able to see what he was doing. Can you imagine why they picked him? The guy in the middle, his name is Mike Collins, and the guy in the middle is the guy who gets to stay in the mothership instead of landing on the moon, and he's got the suckiest job in the universe, I guess. His job sucks not just because he doesn't get to land on the moon, although that's part of it. His job sucks because of the what ifs. What if something happens to the other two on the way down to the moon? What if something happens to them on the moon? What if they can't get back? 
In that case, Colin's job is to turn around and make the three-day silent, sad journey back home, leaving his friends behind. Can you, that is the worst job in the universe. It is July 20th, 1969. It's a Sunday. It's about, I would think of it as 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Maybe you'd think of it as 1600. A few days ago, Apollo 11 took off. They've had a textbook journey to the moon. A few hours ago, this weird-looking spaceship with Armstrong and Aldrin in them separated, and they've been on their way down to the surface of the moon ever since. They are about to enter the critical last 10 minutes of that journey, a part of the journey that NASA calls powered descent. Back on Earth at Mission Control, there is a room full of people arming for war. Their job is to watch the data streaming down from that weird-looking spaceship and be the third, fourth, fifth, 27th pair of eyes, making sure it's working properly. And they are deadly serious. Many of these people are in their late 20s or early 30s, and they have spent a big portion of their adult lives getting ready for this moment. The door is locked. There's an armed guard on the other side of the door. No one is getting in or out until this thing is over. They've locked down the circuit breakers on most of their electrical equipment. They would rather risk a fire than have the lights go out at the wrong moment. Outside of Mission Control in the rest of the United States and in various places around the world, there is a blanket of tension. It's right around now, it's right around 1600 in the United States that something weird starts to happen on the streets. There's very few cars to start with because most people are inside, glued to their televisions. But it's right around now, it's right around 1600, that the cars that are on the road start to pull off. On city streets, they find a place to park. On highways, they go off onto the shoulder. On rural roads, they just stop. The drivers can't drive and listen to their radio, listen to what's going on above the moon at the same time. In this very modest house in Philadelphia on the east coast of the United States, a 10-year-old boy and his dad are sitting on their couch watching the coverage on TV. It's right around now, it's right around 1600 that the dad gets up, walks about halfway to the TV, gets down, and puts his hand on his head. And that's the way he'll stay until it's over. They're watching this guy. This is Walter Cronkite. They're watching him on TV. Walter Cronkite is the, kind of the king of TV news guys in the United States. Cronkite's thing is that nothing upsets him. Nothing bothers him. He regularly goes to the war zones where people are shooting at him and reports in this very even voice what it's like to have people try to kill you. It is 1605, just right at the beginning of that last 10 minutes down to the surface of the moon. Armstrong and Aldrin are at 15,000 meters. They've gone through about a quarter of their fuel to get here, and things are not going well. The problem is that their radio is not really working. Right? They can talk to the ground for a few minutes, but then they'll get these huge bursts of static. And even worse, it's not just the voice, their data is dropping out as well, and they need that third, fourth, 27th pair of eyes watching this machine. So Armstrong and Aldrin, they're doing what you would expect people to do when the radio isn't working. They're changing channels and adjusting the antenna, so they basically have their heads down playing with the technology, and fortunately, they have time to do that because they are not actually flying the spaceship. There is a new cool gadget that's flying that spaceship. It's called a computer. And while it's the rockets and the spacesuits and all the other flashy technology that gets all of, the, all of the press, the computer in that little spaceship, and the, especially the software in that computer, is no less of a leap into the just barely possible. And in fact, the woman who designed the software that is flying that little spaceship. And let me pause here for a minute and say that again, because I don't get to say this often enough. The woman who designed that software, a woman named Margaret Hamilton, has realized 
that what she's doing is different than the software that people have been, were doing before. It's different because it's doing 25 things all at the same time, and it's prioritizing its job, and it's doing everything in real time. And so Hamilton, she comes up with a new term for the kind of software development she's doing. She calls it software engineering. And Hamilton software, the reason that they have Hamilton software in that computer is that Apollo 11 is not just trying to generically land someplace on the moon. They are trying to land at a particular pre-selected spot on the moon. Now, when they were planning the mission, when they were planning the mission, there was a certain amount of controversy over where they should land. On the one side, there were the scientists and the geologists who were saying, yeah, 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 this is all about the Cold War, but this is the scientific opportunity of a lifetime. We have got to land someplace scientifically interesting. And on the other side, there were the astronauts and the rocket scientists kind of bored saying, yeah, okay, what's scientifically interesting? And the geologists and the scientists are like, the bottom of a valley would be good, but you know what would be better? You know what would be better? The, the, bottom of a canyon, the very bottom of a canyon. No, no, even better, the top of a mountain, the summit of a mountain, but you'd have to get all the way at the top. No, no, even better, the rim of a crater, right? Right there on the rim. <laughs> to which the astronauts and the rocket scientists say, yeah, no, we're not landing anywhere near any of those places. And so in the end, it's the rocket scientists who win the argument. And so Apollo 11 is aimed at the flattest, dullest, most geologically uninteresting spot that NASA can possibly find. The computer's flying them there. It is 16.10, five minutes into that 10-minute flight down to the moon. Armstrong and Aldrin are down to 11,000 meters. They've gone through about 50% of their fuel. And good news, the radio is working. Nobody knows why the radio wasn't working, but now it's working great. And you've got to believe that Armstrong and Aldrin are maybe taking a breath and thinking, well, maybe it's going to go well from here. You know, maybe that was our problem. When a display in front of them lights up and it says 1202. 1202 is a message from their computer. Now, I know none of us here are really that familiar with those old computers, so let me see if I can translate 1202 into something just a little more modern. <laughs> Uh, or maybe this, right? Bunch of programmers. <laughs> Their computer is glitching. Armstrong radios down to mission control. 1202, what's 1202? Because there's hundreds of these error codes. The people in mission control, they have this moment of frozen horror. What's 1202? There's hundreds of these codes. And there's one guy in that room, he's in his 20s, his name is Steve Bales, and he is an expert on Margaret Hamilton's software, and he knows that 1202 means that the program, that the software is falling behind. It's being called on to do more stuff than it can get to. But he also knows that when that happens, the programs do the most important things first. And right now, there's only one important thing, fly the darn spaceship. So, they, he has maybe three seconds to make this decision. And he just says, just ignore the 1202s. Just keep going. Just don't pay no attention. So they radioed this up to the astronauts. But the astronauts, they just can't quite ignore the 1202s. For one thing, there's a bad user interface design. There's a bad user interface design. They have to, the 1202 appears, and they have to physically push a button to clear it. And if they don't, it just sits there. And they kind of want to see what the next error code is, because, yeah, ignore the 1202s, but what if the next one's 867, which means the engine fell off or something, right? So they both have their heads down, and they're pushing these buttons, clearing the error codes. It is 1612, seven minutes into that last 10 minute of flight. They're down to 600 meters. They've gone through four-fifths of their fuel. And good news, the 1202s go away. Nobody knows why they came, nobody knows why they're gone, but they're gone. And finally, 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 Armstrong has a chance to look up and look out the window. Right? He's got these, this little triangular window in front of him. Now, if you're flying into Berlin or New York or London, and your airplane's at 600 meters, 
That means you're getting ready to land, right? Your tray table is up, your seatbelt is fastened. You can look out the window and see individual cars. You can see people, and you can see if those people are carrying their shopping, right? At 600 meters, Berlin or London or New York, it's not the place on the map. It's not, you know, where the conference is next week. It's not that place you're going to. At 600 meters, Berlin or New York or London, it's a place. It's all around you. Armstrong looks out the window at 600 meters, and for the first time in human history, the moon is not that light up in the sky. It's not this geopolitical, we're going to kick the Russians' butts by getting their first thing. It is a place. It's all around them. He can look down and he can see the ground scrolling beneath them. And there's rocks and hills and things like that. He can look in the distance and he can see a mountain on the horizon. And the mountain is higher than he is. 600 meters, the moon is a place. Now, nobody really knows what went through Armstrong's mind at that moment, right? Only you would know, like, imagine if you were him, what would go through your mind? I know exactly how I would feel looking out that window, and the word, what I would feel, feel, and the word is fear. The moon is a place. It's the wrong place. Armstrong has been studying maps and photographs. They've made little plaster models. He knows exactly what he should see when he looks out that window, and this is not it. And then it gets worse. Because on that window, there is this scale. And Armstrong can kind of use the scales like a gun sight. He can line his eye up and look down at the ground, and he can see where the computer is taking them to land. So he does that. He lines his eye up and says, where is this thing taking us? And he sees that. <laughs> a very geologically interesting crater. And even where the crater is not that big. The crater is about the size of a football stadium, yours or mine, it doesn't matter. But the crater is surrounded by a huge debris field of boulders. Remember, right? What's a crater? Big rock comes down from the sky, boom, right? There's stuff all over the place. And so there's this huge debris field of boulders. Armstrong looks at that for a few seconds, and he makes a very Neil Armstrong decision. He turns off the autopilot, and he does two things. He kills most of their downward descent, and he starts zooming forward. He does that because he thinks he can see in the distance, past the boulder field, it looks like there's a reasonably flat place to land. And he's got to get there before they run out of fuel. Meanwhile, back at Mission Control, right, they can see Armstrong turn off the autopilot, and they can see him kill most of the downward descent. They can see him zooming forward. The one thing they cannot see is the crater. There's no live video feed. But there is something else they can see. They can see Armstrong's heart rate. He's got heart monitors and things all over his body. And they're watching this heart monitor. And at the beginning of the power descent, Armstrong's heart was beating at about 80 beats per second, probably slower than mine right now. He's only landing on the moon, right? And it slowly has crept up to about 100. And now, in the last few seconds, as he turns off the autopilot and starts zooming forward, it, it spikes up to 150. Clearly, something is up. The reaction of the people in that room in mission control to whatever emergency is going on, they don't know what it is, but something is clearly up. Their reaction is extraordinary. What they do is nothing. And in fact, they shut up. The guy running the show in mission control tells, tells everyone in that room he doesn't want anybody talking to the astronauts anymore. He only wants to send up one bit of information periodically. How much time do they have left? How much time before they run out of fuel? It is 16.14, nine minutes into that last 10-minute flight. Armstrong and Aldrin are down to 5% of their fuel. They're down to 100 meters. And they are zooming over the boulder field, and the edge of the boulder field is getting closer and closer, and it really does look like there's a decent place to land out there. They don't know how fast they're going. No one ever imagined they'd be going this fast, this close to the ground, so their speedometer is off the scale high. 
but the edge of the boulder field is coming up, and they feel like maybe they can make it. It is 16-16, 11 minutes into that 10-minute flight. Armstrong and Aldrin are down to 10 meters, they're down to 3% of their fuel, and they're past the boulders, and this does look like a decent place, and Armstrong is jamming on the brakes to get the thing to stop so he can lower it like a helicopter. And it's right around now that the first ominous warning comes up from the Earth. It's just two words, 60 seconds. You have one minute of fuel left. Armstrong barely hears him because now he has screeched to a halt and he's lowering the thing down. He's trying to find the ground. He's trying to find the ground and at some point they lose sight of the ground because their, their rocket engine is now blowing up this huge cloud of, dirt, of dust. But he knows the ground is down there and it's right around now that they get the second warning. 30 seconds. For God's sake, land this thing. Armstrong barely hears him because again, he's just trying to find the ground Aldrin looks out the window, and he reports that he can see a shadow on the ground. It's the shadow of the spaceship. They are really close now. And then Arn Aldrin looks at the instrument panel, and there's a little amber light, and it's labeled contact. And as he looks at it, the astronauts call it the contact light. And as he looks at it, it comes on. Contact light means that the sensors on the landing gear of this weird-looking thing have touched something hard. Contact light means they've landed. Contact light means that these two guys are not going to die, and better, they're not going to fail. Contact light means that Armstrong and Aldrin, that those people at Mission Control, that the United States of America, that humanity has arrived. But Armstrong and Aldrin are not quite done. The plan had been to fly the thing to about half a meter over the surface and turn off the rocket engine and let it fall the rest of the way. But Armstrong and Aldrin, you know, they were too busy not dying to do that. So now they're sitting on the surface, burning the last of their rocket fuel, and they need to turn off this complicated, dangerous machine full of explosives very carefully. And so they have a shutdown checklist that they go through, and they do it together. One of them will you know, do the step, and the other one will read it and check. They pair astronaut. And so Armstrong starts, he says, shut down, and then Aldrin says, OK, engine stop, ACA out of detent. And they go through this long chain of mumbo jumbo as they're shutting all the systems down. Meanwhile, the people back on Earth, right, they can see that the spaceship has stopped moving. Data streaming down. They can see that they can watch the systems get shut off, and they can hear Armstrong and Aldrin going through the shutdown checklist. And you would think that at this moment somebody would say something momentous, something historical. It's not really how people are. The guy on the ground radios up the completely obvious statement: "We think you landed, right?" <laughs> Armstrong really doesn't respond to that. He gets to the last step on the shutdown checklist. He says, engine, arm off. And then he says the words that he had made up, the words that he had practiced, the words that he wanted to be, the first words spoken from another world. He says, Houston, that's where mission control is, tranquility base here. Armstrong and Aldrin had landed in a place on the moon called the Sea of Tranquility. The Eagle, that's the name of the little spaceship, has landed. And with those words, those highly disciplined, nerdy engineers in mission control with their white shirts and their black ties and their crew cuts, as a group, stand up and start shouting. You can imagine there's some shouting going on in those cars, right? Remember the cars pulled off to the side of the road, right? What would you do if you're sitting in that car listening to this, right? Pound on the steering wheel, shout. Look around, see if anybody's watching you, you know? Certainly, there's shouting going on in that house in Philadelphia. It takes a 10-year-old boy just a few seconds to realize, hey, they've done, th they've done this. This is real. They did it. And then he realizes that his dad is no longer down in that crouch, but his dad is jumping up and down and shouting, and shouting louder than he's ever heard his dad shout. And then the boy realizes it's not just his dad who's shouting. It's the people next door. It's the people on the other side. It's the people across the street. The whole neighborhood is shouting. And it's the kind of noise that you don't exactly hear as you feel in your stomach. And it comes in waves. It'll be really loud, and then it'll trail off, and you think it's going to stop. And then, no, it gets really loud again. And amidst all the shouting, the boy focuses back on the television, 
and he sees the second incredible thing of the day. It was there on TV. It was just for a second. The camera cut away just for a second, but he saw it. He did. He saw it. Just for a second, there was Walter Cronkite crying. That is my story. Um, I say that. I say it's my story. It's not really. It's your story. If you think about that story, everything that was done in that story was done by people like you. If you roll out of bed in the morning and you just want to build the next cool thing, story belongs to you. Right? It is part of our common cultural heritage. And I don't care if you grew up in the United States like I did or the old Soviet Union, here in Germany, elsewhere in Europe, Asia, it doesn't matter. If you're one of us, this story belongs to you. But I did say that this story had lessons to teach us, things to teach us. So let me try and make the case that other than just being kind of a fun story, it has things to teach us. And it has little things to teach us and great big things to teach us. So let me start with the little things. You know what this story teaches us about little things? In a complicated technical project like either software or going to the moon, little things can kill you. Right? Let's talk about the things that went wrong in that last 10 minutes. Right? Why did their radio stop working? Right? For five minutes, their radio didn't really work. Why was that? Well, it turns out it has to do with the steering rockets. Remember steering rockets? Well, the problem wasn't that the steering rockets on this thing didn't uh, function. The problem was that the engineers behind this weird-looking spaceship a few months before it took off, got worried that the steering rockets would actually burn through the skin of the spaceship. Some of these steering rockets were kind of pointed close to parts of the skin, so they put these shields on it to keep the steering, to deflect the rocket exhaust so it didn't get you know, burned through the skin. And those shields worked really well at deflecting the rocket exhaust. It also worked really well at reflecting the radio signals. And at certain angles, it would screw up the radio communications. Guess which angles? When the Earth is like right here, when you're trying to land on the moon. They had never done that before. Right? Little things can kill you. A couple of pieces of sheet metal can kill you. Uh, you know, here's a, Here's a machine that has two million parts. Somebody puts a couple of pieces of sheet metal on it, and it almost fails. Why did their computer crash? Their computer crashed because it had a couple of different modes. One mode was track the ground. That's the mode it should have been in, right? Pay no attention to anything else. Track the ground. The mode it was actually in, there was a switch. You could select the mode. The mode it was actually in was track the ground and the mothership at the same time. Well, it turned out it couldn't actually do that, and it started to fall behind, because the switch was in the wrong place, right? Switch is in the wrong place that can kill you. A couple of pieces of sheet metal can kill you. Why were they off course? They had this pinpoint landing picked out. How did they get off course? For that, we need to go a few hours before the landing, when these two spaceships were hooked together. When they were hooked together, there was like a tunnel that ran between them so the people could go back and forth. And when they were getting ready to separate, they closed the hatch at one end of the tunnel, closed the hatch at the other end, and what they were supposed to do was pump all the air out of that tunnel. Well, maybe they were in a hurry, maybe their minds were on other things. They didn't quite get all of the air out of the tunnel. So when they separated, there was a puff of air that changed the uh, speed of the lander by one kilometer per hour. The thing is going 1,700 kilometers per hour, and it gets bumped so that its speed changes by one kilometer per hour. What possible difference could one kilometer per hour make over two hours? Two kilometers, the distance between a nice, flat, boring landing site and the crater of death. Right? Little things can kill you. But you know what else? The reason they overcame the, thing, the little things that almost killed this effort was trust. Think about the people in Mission Control when Armstrong uh, de turned off the autopilot. They did not radio up to him, Neil, you've turned off your targeting computer. What's the matter? They simply, they simply uh, you know, went, trusted him. <coughs> when the computer crashed, 
Armstrong asked Mission Control. Mission Control asked Steve Bales. Steve Bales basically trusted Margaret Hamilton and her software. This was a chain of trust a quarter of a million miles long, right? <laughs> trust is what overcame the little things that went wrong. There's also, I think, something we can learn about leadership. You need real leadership to do something like this. You need real leadership to do the kind of stuff we do. But in particular, you need to know the difference between a leader and a hero. I think we in the software industry, we spend too much of our time worrying about heroes and heroics and what we really need are leaders. Um, like, take this picture. As an American, I got to tell you, I look at this picture every time and it grabs me, right? It's very heroic. And that's the problem with it. It looks like it was perfect. It looks like there was this guy, and he flew this perfect trip to the moon, and he got out, and he took this lovely picture, and it was all flawless. We know that's not the case. We know that this was, thing was a struggle every step of the way. <clears throat> I like, instead of this picture, you know what I like? I like the shutdown checklist. I like the shutdown checklist because it speaks to me of leadership, right? These are the words of two guys trying to get the job done at the end of a really bad day. I like these words especially. It makes me feel closer to this thing because these are the kind of th this is the kind of mumbo jumbo jargon that we speak to each other with all the time, right? Our jargon is a little different than this jargon, but it's the same kind of incomprehensible nonsense, right? I could be saying something almost as incomprehensible as this when I go to work. You, you too. These are the words of people like us. You know what else these are? These are the first words spoken from another world. I like that they're real words. I like that they're people trying to finish the job. That's something to remember. That's leadership. And that, that kind of brings me to the bigger lessons, I think, of the moon landing. And uh, I think the big lesson of the moon landing starts with the idea that when you do something technically difficult, something technically cool, you cannot um, predict the outcome, right? And so, for example, we went to the moon to win the Cold War and kick the Russians' butts, and a funny thing happened on the way to the moon. Funny thing happened on the way to the moon. We looked back, we looked over our shoulder, and we saw that. We saw ourselves. We saw our place in the universe. Now, I know for maybe everybody here, most of you anyway, pictures like this, they're just kind of part of the wallpaper. You've seen them a thousand times, right? They don't even register anymore. People put them on t-shirts. They're the backgrounds on computers. I would like for you to try to imagine that you had gotten to a certain point in your life having never seen a picture like this before, and then one day somebody comes and slaps it down in front of you. How would it make you feel? What would you say? I can tell you. You say, holy mother of God, that's everything. That's all of us. It's all we've ever known. That is every birthday. It's every first day of school. It's every graduation. It's every first date. It's every love affair. It's every marriage. It's every wedding anniversary. It's every funeral. It's every birthday. It's all we are. It's everything we've ever known. It's beautiful, it's tiny, it's out there in the black. And then you think for a second, and you think, maybe we should take care of it. It's no coincidence, in my opinion, that pictures like this coincide almost exactly with modern environmentalism as a mass political movement. You look at the picture and it just comes to you, right? You do something difficult, you do something technically sweet, and you cannot predict the outcome. Which, and that kind of brings me to what I think of as the big lesson, kind of the why lesson of the story. And it's something I have a hard time putting into words. And mostly I think of it as a conversation. I think of it as maybe you and I go out and have a beer. You think we could find a beer in Berlin? Um, you and I go out and have a beer and Maybe one of us, it doesn't matter which, has an idea, and it doesn't matter what the idea is. Maybe you want to get rich selling pet food on the internet. Maybe I want to create a new programming language or a database or something. It doesn't matter, right? 
Now, maybe you're against the idea, and so you're trying to argue me out of the idea. And you could tell me, um, it's a bad idea. You know, no one will be interested, or it won't, you know, it won't make any money. And sure, we could talk about that. You could tell me that maybe it'll just make society more unfair, that it'll be bad for people. And sure, you know, we could talk about that. Or it'll make your hair fall out or your teeth rot, I don't know. You know, and we could talk about all these things. But one thing you can't tell me, one thing I just won't believe, is that it is not possible. I just won't believe you. See, I'm familiar with the impossible. I saw it done on TV when I was a kid. For me, the ultimate lesson of Apollo is that when you do something hard, when you do something technically sweet, well, congratulations, you have the thing, great. But there's this other effect that goes out from it. It's like a wave. It's a wave of belief. If she can do that, maybe I can do that. It's a, it, it makes people believe in the possibilities. If he can do that, maybe I can do something like that. It makes people believe in themselves. I can do it. I know this for a fact. I know this for a fact because I am the result of one of those waves. I am a child of Apollo. I sat on that couch and my life changed. It got off of whatever path it had been on and it got on a different path. A path that led me to the university and to engineering and programming. A little while after that to writing books and a little while after that to being here with you this morning. For me, the ultimate lesson of Apollo really has very little to do with space travel or astronauts or any of that stuff, and it has everything to do with belief. Now, I said that the story belongs to you, and it does, but the story comes with a challenge. And the challenge is to do the best thing, to build the best thing that you possibly can. You build it because it's worth building. You build it because it will inspire your coworkers. You build it because it will inspire the people coming up through the profession behind you. You build it for the next bunch of 10-year-olds. So for me, the ultimate lesson of Apollo goes all the way back to the words that started it all, all those decades ago. We choose to go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Go do something hard. Thank you.